All right, so congratulations, you made it to the end. Uh, that is the final part of this, what, nine week course that we've done on great religions. Today, it's a little bit of a survey, trying to acknowledge more religions than we've had time to cover, to respect and lift up those people, uh, to enlighten our own minds. And of course, all of this for the purpose of informing your faith. I hope your faith feels encouraged. Uh, in, a, in a quick example, you know, one of the motivations for me to teach this class is Jesus said, love your neighbor as yourself. One way to love people is to seek to understand them, right? So that's what we're trying to do. Um, I hope also at the end of this class to give you more about Christianity, perhaps in a way that helps us connect uh, what we believe with what we have learned about how the world believes and what God would have us do in Jesus Christ as believers in the faith called Christianity today. So that's where we hope to end up. If I would uh, be so well as to go through uh, and follow my notes and achieve those things, it'll be by the grace of God. Hey, as I get started, though, let me make this announcement that here we are the week of Thanksgiving here at Ashby Ponds, and I will have to be on hiatus from teaching with you all through uh, you know, Christmas, New Year. So I'll hope to see you in January. I don't know yet. I want to give you a little more uh, context for that, but I'll tell you at the end of class uh, more about that and where we might go in our next uh, class or teaching sessions together. And by the way, that gives you a number of weeks to dream up something you'd like to hear more about. Send me an email and suggest a topic that would be fun for me to consider as well. Let's dive into this final, um, I would call it a conclusion perhaps, or just a wrap up, and a discussion about primal religions. What is a primal religion? Oh, I'm glad you asked because you're about to find out. <laughs> well, my friends, we have journeyed around the globe and through millennia together. We should feel like we know each other pretty well if we've been doing that kind of time traveling. So we've been visiting seven of the major religions of the world. And just briefly, uh, I wanna to touch on a few others today to demonstrate more variety, to show respect for these peoples, uh, although they may not be considered major world religions. Uh, primal religions are those that are more localized, indigenous to the local culture and customs of specific peoples. Now, in our Western history, I think most all of us are familiar with the Greco-Roman mythologies, uh, which were created most of all to really describe and explain natural phenomena. You know, why does lightning flash across the sky? Well, they told stories because the great God Zeus was casting thunderbolts like spears in war, you know, things like that. <clears throat> Many of us know this, these amusing and often didactic stories explain the world and our place in it. Uh, but that's myth. You know, I'd like to venture elsewhere today, maybe a short spiritual safari for you into some of the primal religions, or that is those who are indigenous to certain places and people uh, spread around the world, still active and alive today. Uh, while we covered the seven major religions, realize those were mostly utilizing written forms like written sacred texts. Uh, many of the primal religions are based in indigenous languages and remain in the oral tradition only. So we really, in, in this class, haven't seen but the tip of the iceberg among many, many religions of the world still active today. You can imagine the oral mode. It, it makes it a little more difficult uh, for us to understand and get into the nuances of those religions. But you could understand uh, tribes uh, expressing their religion still orally and in action, their practices in places like Africa, Australia, Southeast Asia, the Pacific Islands, Siberia, and of course, right here, the tribes, the native tribes from North and South America. So I'm gonna briefly name a few and a few of their unique characteristics. Really for a deeper understanding, we would have to take time for each of these and understand, try to sink into their symbolic world. And we've hardly had time to do that even for the major religions, but a symbolic world is how each of these culture functions and makes sense of reality together. So forgive me, we don't have time for that. All we can do really is just wave at them as they go by. So let's be friendly and watch it. Here we go. First one I wanna lift up today is an ancient religion 
indigenous to Japan called Shinto. Shinto really has no formal deity, no formal texts. It certainly predates Buddhism. It has been the most influential religion in that culture on the islands of Japan over a long period of time. The beliefs and practices revolve around humanity living in harmony with the land and with one another. Now, that's very common among primal religions, but certainly even the major religions as well, right? So that we're not surprised by that, but it's kind of good to, to have that as an affirmation. Now, I have a, a little object listen, lesson for you. Uh, it's not unique to Shinto, but it's from Japan. A friend of mine recently traveled to Japan and brought back this origami, you know, handmade origami swan, uh, symbol of peace. So I'll just pass it around for you all and you can take a look at that. Uh, but, you know, we want to understand and respect all of these religions. And one of the common threads is peace and harmony, right? We would all want that. In Africa, one of the indigenous religions in Africa, and I got to tip my hat, um, I put it on one of the bibliographies, Wade Davis is The Wayfinders. If you haven't read The Wayfinders, it's certainly worth your time. Uh, he's a sociologist, anthropologist type. Uh, but he talks about the San people of Botswana. San is S-A-N, if you're tracking this online. You may pronounce it San, but I'm going to say San. <clears throat> so in southern Africa, in this desert region, the San people are one of the longest living cultural tribes anywhere on planet Earth today. And theirs is a fascinating history of a way of life in a region that it is very difficult for humans to survive in. So they're Bushmen, they're nomadic people, hunter-gatherers, and they live very close to the Earth. Um, <clears throat> they kind of worship a creation or a nature type of worship, you know, season of fertility, a season of rain, which is actually a very, it's hardly a season at all. It's a very brief moment when it rains in their region. And somehow they have to survive the vast majority of these 365 days in a year uh, with a drought. And what do they do? They sometimes have to dig in the dirt to get water. I mean, dig down six inches or sometimes six feet to find water. Often they get water from these roots, roots that they have to extract a drop of water from working most of the day in order to get enough water to survive. Now in their way of life, or we might call it a religion of the sand people, um, fire is viewed as a sacred element. It's a symbol of life. You think of the unity and the centrality of family in their community life as they gather around the fire. Also notable among the San are acts of charity and gift giving. This is how they survive. Gift giving is a mark of their belief and their communal life. All of this is sacred work in the hunt. When a young man is first old enough to go on a long hunt, it's a spiritual journey, a rite of passage. They don't merely hunt and kill. As they engage their prey, they do a ritual dance. So it's a, a way of honoring that animal or honoring nature or God's creation. And they understand that the animal is about to die as a ritual sacrifice, not just as food, but as a ritual sacrifice. So all of life is giving and receiving. That's actually a theme that we find in Christianity and other world religions as well. This sort of mutuality in life, the both end of giving and receiving and understanding that as part of the created order, the way we should live. Now, this reminds me of some of our Native American religions. I, I've been more familiar with the uh, native tribes of South Dakota, for example, the Lakota Sioux. The Lakota, uh, I'll just lift up as one example of many, many Native Americans. One of you had asked, by the way, are there still Native Americans here right now in Virginia? There are. I don't know the names of their tribes, but there's not that many uh, you know, numerically. In America these days, when we talk about minorities and everything, it's a very small percentage of our population. But as you know, Native Americans, important people, still very diverse. Uh, I'll just lift up the Lakota as an example. They have no structure or formal hierarchy. The Lakota believe in Wakan, if I'm saying that right, W-A-K-A-N, the ultimate power or energy, uh, life force permeating the universe and ourselves here on planet Earth. Humans are to live in harmony with this 
power, the wakan. Uh, practices of their religion will involve prayers and the smoking of the sacred pipe. There's a wonderful book, should you want to learn more um, about Native Americans in general, but specifically the Lakota, Black Elk Speaks. You know, it won one of those big literature prizes years ago, so it may be familiar to some of you. Uh, it's wonderful uh, to read that. The revered holy man, Black Elk, of the Ogallala Lakota people, I'll offer a quote from him in his own words. It helps me to understand a little bit more of that symbolic world or religious point of view. Black Elk says, everything an Indian does is in a circle. And that is because the power of the world always works in circles. Everything tries to be round. The sky is round and I've heard the earth is round like a ball. And so are all the stars. Again, the, the idea of a circle, there's sort of a perfection to it, there's sort of a flow, has no beginning or end. You can understand it as eternal. Uh, and it's about flow or peace and harmony, living together, living in concert with, not against the natural world and therefore the people that we encounter in it. Now, I want to tip my hat to another faith. This one is more recent, not as ancient, but wonderful. I don't know enough about this, but one of you here is part of the Baha'i community. It's a modern faith. Uh, it's accepting and respecting of all religions. I really like that. And there's a temple uh, community center right here in Sterling, uh, Baha'i Temple. So I've met several of these people over my years in ministry in this area. I find them very loving and gracious and uh, willing to talk about their faith, which is fantastic. A Baha'i faith is actually less than 200 years old. It teaches the sacred worth and essential dignity of all religions and all people in order to foster unity among all people. Again, just beautiful. Wish I had more on that, but uh, so grateful for our Baha'i friends among us. I do want to focus a little more attention as we wrap up sort of this quick survey of other religions. Zoroaster. Um, Zoroastrianism is something I, again, don't know enough about, but I'm intrigued by it. It's an ancient Iranian or Persian religion. Zoroaster lived 600 years before Christ. So you kind of think about those figures that we learned from other major religions, perhaps like the Buddha, for example, uh, Confucius, you know, people who lived around that time frame. However, a lot of people debate whether Zoroaster is more like 6,000 years prior to Christ. Don't know. But listen to this example from the religious point of view or worldview of Zoroastrianism. We'll just give you like a paragraph, a few ideas, and just see what comes to your mind. The creator of all is good and benevolent. However, evil exists in the world because of a wicked adversary. Humans live in the world of good and evil and must choose between the two. After death, the soul of each individual lives on and they will be judged for their deeds accordingly. People who persist in doing evil will be punished in a dark abyss. Those who resist evil and do good things will be rewarded entering a paradise in the presence of God. Sound a little familiar? Perhaps, yeah. This religious view should sound familiar to the vast majority of religious people on planet Earth today because it sounds like it could fit right in with Islam. It could fit right in with a Jewish point of view. It could fit right in with our own Christian beliefs. Very similar. Uh, Zoroaster was this being of shining light, the light that shines out of the darkness. Uh, a fascinating religion to me because of so, so many of its uh, characteristics dovetail with aspects of our own Christian faith. Um, it's interesting, if you enjoy classical music, this comes to mind, one place where my um, interest in classical music intersects with religion in this case is that of Richard Strauss. If you remember a, a theme entitled, Thus Spake Zarathustra, this is the name of Zoroaster. Zoroaster is actually the Greek name. Zarathustra is the Persian name for this particular character who has been seen as a prophet or a person who just brought a lot of lightness into a dark world. Now, if you're not into classical music, you might also have encountered Zoroastrianism if you're a 
hard rock fan like British rock and roll, the band Queen. Freddie Mercury was a Zoroastrian all his life, uh, although we didn't necessarily see him talking about religion or living. But that's the case with a lot of religion, right? No judgment, Freddie. Um, little is known about Zoroaster uh, personally, and it's even debated about his historical context, but certainly Iran or Persia, perhaps during the time of King Darius from our Old Testament stories in the book of Daniel, uh, we hear about that. It could be the same uh, kingdom that, that he lived in. But the, per the, uh, the point I guess I'm getting at is the basic belief that each person is living in a world that is uh, really both good and evil, and we have those tendencies within ourselves, and, and that the purpose of life is to choose good over evil. And this it resonates with my own faith because it has a strong view of free will, all right? And understanding our human nature where God has given us the gift of free will, and we are to exercise that in responsible and faithful ways. Uh, that is part of that religion that I just think is, is fascinating to see the congruences when you discover some of these ancient world religions. Uh, Zoroastrianism has been said over the centuries to have influenced uh, rather significantly uh, Greek religion and thought itself, um, certainly Christianity, just as it had Judaism in its time. So I'm simply lifting up these historical influences between religions, uh, perhaps those that we're not so familiar with, in order to kind of come full circle to where we began this course some weeks ago. In, in the intro class, I said something about uh, connectivity, you know, that uh, some of the things that we have in common among world religions uh, can help us to see ourselves more fully. I said, perhaps this could be encapsulated most uh, memorably, as it was said so well by the poet John Donne, no man is an island, right? No man is an island, I quote, entire of itself. Every man is a piece of the continent, a part of the main. So it brings me back when I think about that to the origin or the ba most basic element of what religion is. Think about the word itself and what the word religion means literally at its root form it means to re-ligament reconnect tie together these basic fibers of humanity what it means to be human so finding places these religions have informed one another for me just helps me to remember what it's all about to do religion or to be human so let's return to our own uh most all of us are christian here um, so in, in that sense, I'm saying our own religion. Christianity began on the stage of human history. So as I try to think about what I've learned over these weeks from other religions and what I know about my own and how it informs a deeper understanding of my own faith, I would say this. Understand that Christianity is a historical religion. That is, it begins through the person of Jesus who was born into the world. You think about Luke. When Luke tells the story in the gospel of Jesus' birth, he immediately says, during the time of the government, so he gives a name to the historical political leadership, which dates it in history. Or the fact that Joseph and Mary had to travel to Bethlehem, which wasn't a nice holiday trip, you know, to enjoy a good meal with family. It was because, well, political and economic motivations that were pressed upon them. So what I'm trying to say is, remember that Christianity is a very this world religion. Because when we talk about religions, we can drift off into the abstract. It can become sort of theoretical or high-minded, uh, as we've said in Christianity before. Sometimes it's all pie in the sky by and by. When I believe what's really intended, what Jesus himself did, was to bring it here and now. God becomes immediate right here, right now, very present, very real in this world. And that reminds me of one of the main themes of our own faith. God loves the world. You know, that verse, for God so loved the world that he gave his son. Right. What world? This world, right here, right now. Who? All people of the world God loves. And so to seek to love people is to seek to understand them in that spirit of love where we're talking about this, trying to re-ligament or tie it together in some way. So one of the questions I asked you, or I've asked myself about faith and what you believe, what I believe, 
What kind of world do you want? I want the kind of world that God continues to love. You know, we live in a time where I think we really accentuate, exacerbate, um, irritate uh, the differences among people. Uh, but I think it's a time where when we think about what kind of world do I want to be in? Religion helps us create positively the better world that God envisioned to bring people together rather than divide them apart. So religion could describe a world, uh, what kind of world would I want or what kind of religion would I want? One that all people would benefit from. So in a better world, all people are blessed by God, not one specific group over the other, which is too often what we find in religion, particularly the history of my own religion. Um, think about it a little bit more from a historical point of view in Christianity. You know this, but let me try to stitch it together. After the resurrection of Jesus, what happens? The book of Acts records the historical development of what became known as the Christian church. But you could say it is really the history of the movement of the Holy Spirit. And I think this is one of the distinguishing features. We have this book of Acts, this, this whole gospel of the Holy Spirit, and then the theology that comes into our faith after the time of Jesus' resurrection and ascension, the presence of the Holy Spirit, this theology, as Paul has unpacked it and others who wrote the New Testament, is a movement of the Holy Spirit that doesn't have an ending. So it's still happening now, although we kind of close the book on what we've said. This will be the canon of sacred scripture, Old Testament, New Testament. We're not adding to that. But think about the book of Acts doesn't have a conclusion or an ending. It's this introduction on the stage of human history, the work and movement and continual presence of God through the Holy Spirit. So one spirit in all people. Think about that as a very powerful distinction or let's just say beautiful characteristic of Christianity. So our faith has been informed and influenced to some degree by other religions. And we're going to talk about that for a minute. But what we have today is still a developing story. We are part of today the body of Christ that God had set in motion uh, when Jesus was on the stage of human history some 2,000 years ago. So it's kind of a powerful thought when you think about it. Uh, but let's talk, putting it together here as I wrap up, let's talk a minute about these basic influences on Christianity, that the Jewish religion influenced, influenced Christianity greatly is pretty self-evident, right? You don't need me to... So yeah, Jesus was Jewish, 12 disciples, Jew, it was first a movement within Judaism, and then as it broke away, certainly a movement of the spirit and the creation of the church. Um, Greeks, certainly the Greek mythology, Greco-Roman worldview, uh, a lot of the language certainly influenced, oh my goodness. Think about Greek. So when you're in a language and that language is the dominant language, the understanding, again, the symbolic nature of that language and how it means for people in their daily life uh, is so informative, right? Or it transforms, right? The Bible that Jesus read, if you can say that, the Bible that Jesus read from, he had a scroll in the synagogue, was the Greek Old Testament, or that is the Septuagint, which was, because Greek was like the English of the day, right? And so that version greatly informed Christianity. Uh, I might even make the case, as some of you have heard me say this before, uh, I don't want to be tiresome about it, but the Greek influence, let's say, through the conquering Macedonian king, Alexander the Great. It's almost as if 300 years before Jesus, God was setting the stage for the movement of the Spirit and the birth of the church and the spread of Christianity around, you know, Middle East, uh, what was we call Europe now, uh, that part of the continent, but also a bit into Asia. Thankfully, due to this spread of Hellenistic culture, Greek, Greek culture by Alexander the Great, and of course, the acceptance of the Greek language and the paved Roman roads made Paul's journeys and the missionary efforts of the apostles all the more effective and <clears throat> quickly done, uh, as we might say, in historical comparative times. Wow. Yeah. So the Greek uh, influence on Christianity, I'll give you one other quick example. The phrase, the immortal soul, 
The immortal soul is something when I say this, all of us say, yeah, well, you know, you've gotten an afterlife idea and that each of us individually has a soul that carries on either up or down, right? You punch that elevator button depending on your belief, but hopefully going up, uh, but you have an immortal soul. The phrase immortal soul, which is very Greek, you know, has derivation from uh, that ancient uh, mythology uh, is not found in the Bible, <clears throat> but certainly the implications are right. And so we kind of stitch those together uh, Everything scripturally points to first having a resurrection of the body, right? So there's a tie between the soul and the actual body. Uh, and, and not to get too deep into this, but just saying, I think we sometimes can't even recognize how much Greek thought, philosophy, and the language influenced our Christian faith. Because it's like saying to a fish, can you describe water? I mean, you've just kind of grown up in it in Western civilization. And so our Western Christian view of it, it just kind of goes hand in hand. Um, think about it this way, if this is helpful. I've done this in other classes. In Christianity, we have at work a process called dialectical thinking. Now, that's a little heady. That's a little uh, philosophical. And certainly it comes from uh, the German philosopher Hegel, you know, just a few hundred years ago. So we're kind of pressing that back. But understanding it, I think, helps us to understand our faith and a little bit about what it is that's unique about Christianity and how our religion has sort of processed other religious influences fairly effectively. So the dialectical is a process that goes from thesis, antithesis to synthesis. It's like God in Christianity allows us to take one thing and then take something very different and kind of blend them together, and we have something new. And we see this in the Gospels. We see this in the New Testament writings like Paul. Jesus and Paul were dialect, dialectical thinkers, not, not so much dualistic thinkers. In a lot of religion, dualism factors large. You can even think about the, the Greek history like Plato. Um, you know, it's black or white. There's no gray in between. It's one thing or another. Either or thinking is using a lot of contrasting and comparing in our analysis of things. Uh, but rather, Jesus and Paul bring Christianity to this place of blending. It becomes a both and type of way of understanding the world. Jesus might say it this way, a little bit of his dialectical teaching. Jesus would say, you've heard it said, but I say to you. And now there's this new way to live faithful to the old way, the old scripture, but in a new elevated way. And all of the gospel kind of brings that out. So Christianity, I think this is key to understanding, has used this both and approach to understanding God, understanding our place in the world and how to be human. Um, I think we have done it over time effectively by in some ways welcoming some elements of other religions and then mixing it with our story and then elevating the meaning. I'll give you an example as we head into the holidays. You're probably familiar with this little gift giving tradition we have called Christmas, right? We celebrate the birth of Christ. That wasn't something Christians did right from the get go after Jesus had ascended into heaven. It actually took several hundred years to decide, yeah, we should start. And why? Why did we decide, oh, well, let's honor his birthday. I mean, birthday is just, you know, today, you know, a child birth is a big deal. But 2000 years ago, people didn't even have a birth certificate. They didn't really remember the exact day of birth. That wasn't a big deal. But what was the meaning of Jesus, that person as a shining light who's come into a dark world? Other religions had certainly celebrated uh, I mean, you can't name how many primal religions celebrate the change of seasons or, for example, the winter solstice when it's the darkest time of year, light a fire, celebrate the light and pray for the return of the light. And so it was kind of natural to place Jesus celebration of his birthday around that, you know, the darkest time. Of year. How do we know that that probably wasn't his birthday? Well, I mean, you know, nobody knows for sure. Uh, would it be that we were correct even in the time of year? Mm, just think very basic. Nobody needs a, a scholar to help you with this. If the scripture stories have shepherds in the fields around the time of his birth, it's probably not the solstice in the winter time. Do you know what I mean? Uh, so it could have been Jesus was actually born more in the springtime, but it doesn't matter. 
What Christianity has done is taken what people were already celebrating out in the culture. Oh, you're celebrating the light. Hey, let's celebrate Christ because Christ is the light. And so it becomes the defining. Uh, I don't know. I should say the defining because Easter's right along with it. So we'll talk about that in a minute. But again, it's about the celebration of God's presence coming into a dark world. And that's the message that Christianity wanted to bring. And so it didn't fight against sort of the indigenous religions that were around, but worked with that sort of a both and to blend into something new with a deeper or elevated human meaning, spiritual meaning as well. All right, here's another quick example. Think about baptism. Christianity didn't invent, you know, seeing water as a sacred gift of life or a symbol of new life. Uh, and it didn't start, I mean, Jesus himself was baptized. So baptism was around as an act of spiritual cleansing or repentance, you know, for centuries. And certainly other religions have a similar tradition. But what does Christianity do? It kind of takes that and then blends it with a new meaning, the actual death and resurrection of Jesus. And it gives it this whole new sacramental understanding that going down under the water not merely cleansing, but a complete like crucifixion of the negative aspects of one's character. And then coming out of the water is like a complete new life, rebirth, uh, resurrection, a little resurrection for every believer who experiences baptism. And we are charged with, we are filled with that living presence of God, Christ or Holy Spirit, however you want to understand it, so that we can live in a new elevated form the life of Christ on earth. We'll get to that more in a minute, but think about how Christianity has taken this both and approach toward other cultures and other religions all along. Um, think about how the Romans did this in the time of Jesus, their approach towards other cultures like Alexander the Great before them, some hundred years before them. Um, they would come into a conquer a people, forgive me, but that's, you know, just put it bluntly. So they'd come in and conquer, however, with some respect for the local religion and culture and language of the people. Uh, so the indigenous beliefs could survive uh, and Christianity kind of has the same thing. We might come into a region, but also reappropriate, but put this elevated story or message or meaning upon uh, those practices. Uh, Easter is the other example I wanted to lift up. Isn't it interesting? It's the day of the Lord's resurrection, but in church we call it Easter, and Easter's not a word that's in the Bible. Ever thought about that? Eggs and bunnies? Anybody seen those symbols for Easter? What, what is that? Right? So it comes from, likely, we don't know for sure. We talk about origins and influences. It's all over the map, right? But likely, uh, though Easter's not a word in the Bible, it comes from an Anglo-Saxon spring goddess named Oester, if I'm saying that right. E-O-S-T-R-E. -E. Uh, again, ancient primal religions celebrating the spring equinox, celebrating the change of season, celebrating fertility. That's why eggs and bunnies are images for new life. Even though it doesn't come from Christianity, what do we do? These are not Christian symbols, holdovers from other fertility religions, but we celebrate new life and bring an ultimate elevated meaning to it for all humanity. Jesus conquered death. And, and we do know it was around the springtime. It was around the celebration of the, what? The Jewish celebrations like Passover. So we, it's a movable feast, we would call it, you know, in Christianity, if you follow that kind of language uh, in your background. Um, December 25th is the same day every year. So that's a fixed day of celebration. But Easter follows a certain pattern where it moves around the springtime and uh, the Sunday after the first full moon. So all those things are interesting. But what the point I'm making is in Christianity, it seems that we've always taken, you know, a both and approach and worked this. So there's a deeper, more Christian focused meaning to celebrations and practices that people have been doing in many cultures over many times and places. And that Jesus conquered death and that there is new life and new hope in the springtime is again this teaching about the Holy Spirit, the very living presence of Almighty God alive on earth as resurrected people. That is, changed people have changed the world. So we see Christianity coming out of human history and then upon the stage 
after Jesus has ascended to heaven, uh, the stage of human history is led by the Holy Spirit that is in people. As I talk to you all about Eastern Orthodox Christianity, there is this great belief or trust, more of a central focus than my experience in Protestantism, on the presence of the Holy Spirit in ordinary people. I said, you know, it makes me shake my head a little bit being a professionally religious person. You really got to trust God a lot to trust God in people. But that's the story. That's the story that Easter really brings is that in the resurrection, Jesus has now resurrected life in us that we might live at a new level as human beings. And, and that's what Jesus really came to do was to live this life as a human being, God's presence on earth, to show us that we can also do it in him by his grace, not my goodness, by his grace, but we can live more fully human, more fully human, the way that God has always intended us to restore that broken image of God in all of created persons in humanity. All right, I'm starting to make a little sermon. Forgive me for that. I get excited about what I believe or what the faith teaches me. I think it's fascinating. Um, but Christianity, like many religions, takes the world as you see it. It takes nature. It takes ordinary things. I mentioned water. How about bread? Bread and wine. You know how ordinary it is for people to share that. But in the story of Jesus, in the person of you know, God's personal presence on earth, these become sacramental elements that elevate our experience and transform our identity as Christian people. So we believe in the real presence at the communion table, that God's presence is real and transformative. So a lot of us, we go to the, you know, maybe we go to the communion table with a little bit of, I don't know, just sort of ritual practice. We may be going through the motions or most of us, when we, when we feel something or we have a very deep intention about going to communion, it's to ask God's forgiveness, rightly so. And those things are real. But understand that even on another level, a higher level, it's the very presence of God energizing us or connecting us, religion, reconnecting, connecting us again anew with the power of the Holy Spirit to live lives that are transformed. So it's not so much about how the, the bread is actually, because there's been this huge debate in Christian, you know how religions will debate all sorts of things. Huge debate on how, how is that bread actually transformed into the body of Christ? But we don't taste it as flesh. We taste it as bread, but it's literally trans. It's not about, I got this from my Roman Catholic friend who's a priest. Don't, don't, don't shoot me for saying this, okay? Because I'm getting this from, not putting any, any Catholics down. I'm just saying, if we understand what's happening in the sacraments, it's not how the object or the, the physical element like bread or like the wine or in Methodism, grape juice, because Mr. Welch was, uh, anyway, Methodist. It was all about trying to move people away from alcohol. But Mr. Welch, of course, wanted to sell a lot of grape juice. And I'm grateful for that for my friends in recovery. It's not about the transformation of those basic physical elements. The sacraments are about the transformation of you and me, about people. Changed people are how God changes the world. And here's my final point. If I, can I make a final point? Uh, sorry to promise. One of the last things I'll say. You and I in our faith are here as actual participants in the very life of God on earth. What am I saying? It's by God's grace and God's presence, not because we're such good people. But in the scripture or in our Christian faith, we learn this identification of Christ with the body of Christ. When Paul, who was Saul, who was Jewish, you know, Jewish teacher who was converted to Christ, he was persecuting other Christian believers, right? When Paul is, you know, blinded by the light, as the story goes, Jesus in a vision, Jesus himself from heaven speaks to Paul and asks him a very important question. Why are you persecuting me? Do you remember that? He doesn't, Jesus doesn't say, why are you persecuting my people? people. Jesus says, why are you persecuting me? So Jesus identifies with us or that we should identify as the hands and feet of Jesus literally on earth. We are the body of Christ, not a nice title, a real and living presence enlivened by the Holy Spirit within each of us here on earth to embody the faith so that the world may know and believe that Jesus 
is Christ or that God is alive in a way that loves the world personally today <clears throat> through you, through me, through us together as the church is a very powerful thought. It's not abstract, but it's the very real presence and power of Christ in and among us or as us collectively. So it leads me to a statement. Again, I don't want to put any stumbling block for anybody, but some of my Catholic friends have used this term, the universal Christ. Now, that's not to say that all roads lead to one, you know, no matter what religion you are. Every, but it is to say, I believe Christ, God from heaven, goes down to everyone. So everything is spiritual. Everything is in Christ. Christ becomes the pattern for all of our life, death and rebirth. This understanding of both and are under God's rule. And God is involved in this world as messy as it is even today. So Christ demonstrates to us what it means to be fully human and lives his life within us right now so that we might be our best humanity for one another. Again, kind of bringing peace and harmony. You know, all these things, you could just lift up for a moment um, some of the common, if you just wanted to name five common things that I find in Christianity, but also in most of these religions, there is a creator or an ultimate being, a life force, some would use that. Second thing, life is precious and sacred. Take it seriously. So there's deep value in human behavior, in action that, you know, moral actions or ways to live, ethics matter. The golden rule, very common among religions. Uh, the golden mean, that is usually sin or difficulty uh, break in relationships is found in the extremes. If you're way over in this direction and only in that direction or way over in this other direction, you know, both extremes are not valid, not the best way to live. So this happy, I don't want to say happy, <laughs> but this hard fought common ground is worth the effort and that golden mean or that uh, we might hear it in a saying like all things in moderation. It, that's the gist of it. So first, there's a creator. Second, life is precious and there's a good way to live it, right? Live it the best way you can because it's a sacred gift. Life is there's also an afterlife. This is a very common theme. Not every single religion, but most religions have some view of the afterlife. And when I mentioned about Zoroaster, uh, you hear how common some of the themes of afterlife is. But the point, I th one of the things about the afterlife is, in this interesting, in our own faith, Jesus didn't come back to tell us more about what heaven looks like. You know, and sometimes you kind of want to take him by the cloak and say, can I, can I get a little more information? Please? I would, sorry, Jesus, I would never do that. Um, but you know, it's a little disappointing for those of us who want to get a clearer picture of heaven. But he comes back again to tell us more about how to have a clear picture of the way to live on earth. Somebody asked me in the youth group, uh, what about the second coming of Christ? And I said, well, I don't think we've done enough with the first. <laughs> so, I mean, you know, if we really could do well with that, maybe the second coming would happen. But the point is, there is an afterlife. Quite often, it's not about how pleasurable you'll have it or exactly how you get qualified to get in it. It's about understanding life is not fair right here, right now. God does care about justice and that much of what will be satisfying about justice will happen in the afterlife. It's not going to be realized here on earth. And most, most religions give some sort of indication that that's probably the case. Now, one last thing. So I said, you know, there is a creator. Uh, life is precious, you know, so live it well. Uh, don't take it for granted. It's a gift. There is an afterlife and there is justice. The, the last thing would be wisdom. Maybe that's just four. I'm talking too much to count. I'm not good with numbers, forgive me. Okay, thank you. Somebody, somebody validated it as five. There is a wonderful scope. I would just say a very broad, wonderful, and diverse scope of wisdom, of good teaching among all the world's religions. And any one of us can have a humble heart and say, I can learn. I can learn from it. I mean, so as a Christian... You know, one of the first things you learn in your identity is that I'm always a disciple. You know, uh, one of my friends in the recovery community in AA had told me they have a saying, the learning never ends. Right. And, and so when you have that heart, hey, I'm open to learn something new. I can learn from anyone. In fact, I want to have intentional ways that I seek to learn from my opponents. If you understand, I don't like the word enemies. Jesus said, love your enemies. But I do know there are people who think very different from me. 
And my goal is not to convince them that they're wrong and that I'm right, but rather to listen carefully to understand. I'll love them better. I'll pray for them better if I can understand them. And by the way, every human being, even, you know, when I was in uh, high school, I was involved in a Young Life uh, interdenominational, and, and we often were out in the community helping the homeless. I had these relations. I would be walking to school and I'd recognize a guy that I had met in mission. You know, he's on the street and everything. And I knew I could learn something. I could learn. Something. One thing I learned is a lot of people who are unhoused today suffer from mental illness and can't get medical help. So have some patience and compassion with people before we judge them. Right. So there's a lot of wisdom I can learn from everything. And if I could just sum the wisdom up in, in, in the world religions we've covered, it's like this. Live in peace and harmony, not in anger and resentment. How about that? And Jesus paved the way for forgiveness was even the way of Jesus in the resurrection. He didn't come back for getting even or anything. So all of us are participating in the actual life of God, the real presence in the body of Christ, which is Jesus in us. And so I come down to this idea of the universal Christ or, or God, his presence all around the world, elevating humanity and our experiences, all, all the news, all the headlines, notwithstanding that, yes, there is a presence of God almighty at work on planet earth today. And we are part of it. I'll just end with a quote from Colossians chapter one. This is from the message translation because I like the language in it. Um, just think about how. Uh, Colossians is just one of those sort of hierarchic, uh, beautiful cosmic Christ imagery, right? And it says about you and me, Colossians 3, verse 3. Your true self is hidden in Christ. Just think about that belief that we are in Christ and Christ is in us. And there's mystery to it. We're not going to be able to explain all of these things. So live with the mystery and understand that beautiful presence of God is in you. And your true life is hidden in Christ. So here's the quote, Colossians 1, 26, 27. This mystery has been kept in the dark for a long time, but now it's out in the open. God wanted everyone, not just Jews, to know this rich and glorious secret inside and out, regardless of their background, regardless of the religious standing. This mystery in a nutshell is just this. Christ is in you. So therefore, you can look forward to sharing in God's glory. It's that simple. That's the substance of our message. And for me, it's just one of the most beautiful, distinguishing features of Christianity. God is alive, active, and present in you, in us together, among us as the body of Christ, the church in the world. So that's the Christian faith. We live it. We live as spirit-filled and spirit-led people. Hopefully we'll give, give evidence to that, right? Uh, but we are in Christ and Christ is in us. So we live in this enchanted world filled with the presence of the living God. So much, so much still to learn and experience. And I hope that as you grow in faith and continue to deepen your understanding of Christianity, then you also will live and experience that transformation that God wants to continue to make present in each of our hearts, this transformation because changed people are how God keeps changing the world for the better, we hope, right? For the better. Amen. I'll do a couple questions and answers offline here in just a minute, but I got to conclude where I started with this announcement. It's, it's going to be a long break for me. Um, I, I'd rather be here with you all. Uh, it's not just that December or the holidays are a busy time as a lead pastor of a growing church. That's exciting. But some of you have heard this already, and I, I want to lift it up as a parting prayer request. My associate pastor, Pastor Steve Hall, has been diagnosed with cancer. He's 77 years young. It's cancer of the throat and tongue. Uh, so you're going to do chemo and radiation combined, and he's going to be out on medical leave probably for two and a half months. Hopes to come back for Ash Wednesday. Uh, we have an interim pastor coming in, uh, but that's more like a substitute preacher on Sunday morning, not somebody to do everything. So I'm going to be swinging in to uh, have more time some touch points over there on the um, Lansdowne Woods campus, uh, but also I'll be the first on call for uh, congregational needs and so on and so forth. So my time is going to be really limited, but my point is um, I hope to rejo uh, rejoin you all some point in January. It may not be the very first Tuesday of January, but between myself and Joe Hall, 
we will let you know the details. But we got time then for you to inform me, what else do you wanna look at? What would be interesting to study or maybe a rabbit to chase? Maybe we'll do that at Easter. Uh, uh, you know, just, you get these ideas of, hey, we've never really thought so much about this. Let's go in that direction. Who knows, but somebody might suggest the Holy Spirit. I mean, as a Methodist, we have done the very least with the third person of the Trinity uh, than of anything else, it seems. But I am convinced that this is one of the uh, greatest parts of the Christian faith, knowing and understanding the presence of God's Spirit with you. Now, prayers for Steve Hall, his wife, Brenda. He will go to the Veterans Hospital in Richmond, so he's really going to be out of town staying at one of those extended stay hotels uh, during most weeks, occasionally come up in the weekends. Uh, but they have been near and dear to the hearts of people at Galilee. Uh, Steve, like myself, a uh, Methodist preacher's kid. But the really neat thing about Steve, most people don't know, is that his dad was the pastor at Galilee back in the 1970s. And Steve was singing in the choir. So he's kind of like one of our own uh, family members. But I want to close with a, a quick prayer for my associate pastor, his wife, Brenda, as they begin. In 10 days, they begin the um, chemo and radiation simultaneously. Uh, I say they because she's gonna be the head nurse, you understand. So let's take a moment to pray. God, we join our hearts. We know your spirit is stitching together all of us. So we're in community together. We may not know sometimes personally the people we pray for, uh, but Lord, I do know that uh, your presence is already at work. Your healing hand is already upon our friend, Steve Hall. We pray for his total healing, strengthen him each day for this battle, uh, but remind him and Brenda both that the battle belongs to you, oh God, just like your word says. We pray for Brenda to have peace among this difficulty, and Lord, we lift it up for healing in the name of Jesus Christ, amen.